Before we get into the show, a quick reminder to check out and subscribe to the Beer Edge podcast with Andy Crouch. Each week, he's doing deep dives into breweries, talking with journalists covering the beer space, and unpacking a lot of what makes the beer industry so interesting. Find the Beer Edge podcast wherever you download shows. This is Drink Beer, Think Beer, the podcast that gets to the bottom of every pint. I'm John Hall. And if you've been curious about pickle beer, this is the show for you. I'm talking with Cody Martin. He's the co-founder of Martin House Brewing in Texas. And this week, the brewery released the latest in its pickle beer lineup, a pickle beer in grape punch flavor. Apparently, it's a Lone Star State thing. First... This show is brought to you by NZ Hops, the cooperative of master hop growers. They are a passionate collective of farms dedicated to innovation and sustainability. Leading the charge in sustainable farm practices, some NZ Hop farms have over five generations of knowledge that inform their composting program used by growers to promote healthy, regenerative growth of hops year upon year. This creates high quality soil, a critical component of healthy growing conditions. At NZ Hops, they feel that sustainability is not only being a steward for the land, but for our future. We're in it together. Join the conversation at nzhops.co.nz or on LinkedIn, Instagram, or Twitter. And we're also brought to you by Dragon's Milk. 20 years ago, New Holland Brewing Company embarked on a journey into the unknown, brewing the first batch of Dragon Milk bourbon barrel aged stout. What started as a single barrel in the back of the brewery has transformed into the best-selling American-made stout today, pairing rich notes of chocolate and coffee from roasted malts with deep tones of vanilla and oak from its time in bourbon barrels. Each bottle of Dragon's Milk is a delicious adventure waiting to be opened. Find Dragon's Milk near you at dragonsmilk.com. So if you were scrolling through social media this week, the beer tinted kind of social media, you likely saw the color purple. Martin House Brewing in Texas announced its latest beer in what they call a micro seasonal. And it's a riff off of their extremely popular best made pickle beer, a variation made with grape Kool-Aid. Cody co-founded the brewery with two friends nearly a decade ago, and as he'll explain in a moment, he had plans for a saison to be his flagship, but the market dictates different things. He's an experimental guy, and he's happy to try different ingredients in different ways to see where they land in a beer. In the last few years, the brewery has gotten notoriety for making a beer that tastes like wing sauce and for another that tasted like ranch dressing. But it's the pickle beer made in collaboration with Best Made, a local company that has paved the road to success and made the brewery famous. Now it's the flagship and it's found at grocery stores and other stores around Fort Worth. And the special releases like this purple version come out every now and again. Cody's going to talk about recipe development and how these beers came together. And he also offers up a simple recipe for you to make cool ickles, that's what they call them, at home. He spoke to me over Zoom from the Fort Worth, Dallas Metroplex area, and I started off by asking him how the beer scene has changed from when Martin House started. Here's our conversation. Can you chart for me the evolution of craft beer in Texas since you opened up, what, just about a decade ago, a little like eight years ago now? Yeah, uh, I mean, we, we sold our first beer in March of 2013, so... Um, we are coming up on, um, doing math in my head real quick. What is that? Nine years. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, when we wrote our business plan, there were three other operating breweries in the entire DFW Metroplex, um, that we used as sort of, you know, just case studies for our business plan. Who were they? Do you remember? Yeah. It was Deep Ellen Brewing Company. It was Franconia Brewing Company. It was RAR. Um, and two of those three I know are still around. Is Franconia still around? Franconia is still around. They've changed ownership. Um, they've remained quite small. I, I, I honestly, you know, I, I don't know what's going on with them. Deep Ellum obviously, uh, has become quite big and, you know, RAR is right down the street from us. And I still know most of the people that work there personally, um, but Franconi, you know, I never, I never really got to know those guys real well, and I, I, I know that they've changed ownership. I know they still exist, but I don't, 
see much of them and I, I i i just i don't know a lot about them to be honest i'm, I'm sure they listen to the show so i'm sure they'll reach out afterwards but um uh, yeah, anyway i, I got i got you off on a pretty pretty big tangent pretty quick yeah that's all right uh, tangents tangents are how things get interesting um yeah so there were the, the three operating breweries when we started writing the business plan and we kind of used those as case studies and you know examples of whatever when we were trying to justify to ourselves and maybe potential investors uh you know why this would work and 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 uh you know by the time we wrote the business plan uh and ended up launching the brewery uh i think th three others uh community four corners and it might just be those two maybe another one i'm forgetting right now opened up so we were the sixth or seventh brewery to open in the dfw metroplex and now i'm talking about a, 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 a brewery whose primary goal is you know distribution not there are a couple of brew pubs in town yeah that i'm not i'm not counting um so uh we were the sixth or seventh production brewery in the entire dfw metroplex um and now you know i would i would say that 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 number is i i i, I can't keep up but i would say it's you know in the 30s or 40s in dfw um for distributing breweries and you know if you talk about brew pubs if you had brew pubs on you maybe during the business plan era there might have been three or four or there's at least you know 30 or 40 now so um it's it's uh changed quite a bit and what do you think is the biggest change beer wise in in the nine years since you've been opened Beer wise, as in, you know, uh, types or, of beers or, or no, I, I guess, you know, consumer wise or just the overall market wise, like every city is, is obviously different. Everybody has, you know, different tracks that they have to walk to, you know, sell their beer to get people in the door to try to, you know, get their own little you know, slice of the local craft pie. Um, what, what sure. do you think has been what do you think has been the evolution in you keep you keep calling it a metroplex which which is a new word for me but like it's um the greater dallas fort worth area what what do you think has been the driver for, right yeah, here, yeah. here I, I like to call it fort worth dallas you know myself okay. is, that's sorry just, uh, that was, that was my, I, I'm, I'm that was my east coast elitism showing there no, yeah. no, no 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 everybody calls it dallas fort worth that's a little fort worth joke so um yeah, uh, I mean, this is, you know, I, I use that word just to, to represent the entire metro area. So it's, you know, there's 20 cities that are all basically one big city. So, you know, that's that's what we call it around here. Anyway, um, yeah, so uh, th there's a lot of big differences. I mean, I can remember when we first started this this business, you just walked into a bar and said, hey, I'm the new local brewery. And they said, all right, send me some beer. And, uh, you know, that's absolutely not the case anymore. I mean, you, you, just being local is no longer the, the differentiator. It's no longer quite it's no longer special quite frankly um uh so that that's changed a lot um and so w one thing specifically for us is we are primarily self-distributed to this day i believe we're the biggest self-distributed brewery in texas now we do work with a distributor in some areas of texas but the volume we distribute i think is the biggest self-distributed volume in texas um and so uh that 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 doesn't work anymore period uh you know the, the big grocery chains the walmarts the kroger's they're refusing to do business with self-distributed breweries in general. They're, while it's still legal, there's not a, really a practical way to to have any volume as a self-distributed brewery anymore. Um, and we were lucky enough to get in early enough and do that successfully enough that we've been able to maintain that um, for the most part. So you so still have changed. those relationships, even though so we, somebody we, showed up now, they they they'd say, you know, hit the bricks, self-distributed brewery. You wouldn't get a chance. And, and, and look, and, you know, we, 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 you know, reminisce all the time around the brewery here, you know, if, if we had made some of those mistakes we made way back then now, like, I, I'm not sure we'd be in business quite frankly. I mean, we made, we, 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 you know, we, we did some, you know, we made some mistakes. We thought we were knew more than we did. And, you know, we, we, we were in a time where we were forgiven for those things. And, and, and uh, I'm not sure that, that that's the case for a brewery that would open now. I, I don't know so. if I want to send you into to therapy with reopening up old wounds, but like you brought it up. What, what comes to mind as mistakes that make you cringe now that you I don't mean, think so, you could have recovered from? Right. So I mean, we, today? sure. So uh, let's, uh, we got, we're going to have to, so 
this is kind of a difficult one because uh, trends have shifted, but let's rewind back to 2013. We decided that we were going to launch our beer in a, a 16 ounce four pack as a differentiator. Well, 16 ounce four packs have come back. They're cool now. So we're making them again, but um, they did just, this did not move um, at retail. I mean, people really? did not buy that. And also, I mean, we launched with the Saison as one of our primary brands, which is my personal favorite beer. And to this day is one of my favorite beers. But, yeah, I mean, God bless you um, for it. But uh, pe- yeah, people don't want people don't like that. I mean, people don't <laughs> buy that. Um, we launched with the we want we, we, we launched with four beers. And right now, only one of those beers is still in our core lineup. Um, so, you know, the, the beer choice um just you know the way we thought we would be able to distribute i remember we we would show up at um you know central market which is a big grocery store here um as one of our biggest customers in the beginning it's kind of a you know more um upscale crafty sort of grocery store and so you know they were working with locals and so we showed up for our first delivery and delivery truck that wasn't even close to rated for the amount of beer we're we're carrying and we dropped that beer off and we have a handwritten receipt book this is how we were going to do our invoices and they looked at us and they were like, no, this isn't going to work, man. You got to you got to give us like a, a real invoice. I'm not going to take a handwritten invoice. And, you know, they want You're giving were, them bar napkins. Yeah. yeah, almost basically. Yeah. I mean, it's basically like, you know, the receipt book you buy it, you buy it Office Depot. The, um, to, so, I mean, there's things What's like the Southern that. term, bless your hearts. Yeah. 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 Um, so, you know, th- th- those things were, were forgivable back then, you know, and. And luckily, you know, I've got an, I've got an awesome team, and we were able to build a, a distribution business that is, quite frankly, you know, a beast of its own, and and, and rivals some of the smaller distribution companies in town in it, in the volume that we distribute on our own. Um, so you know, we, we we've actually become you know a very successful distributor. You know, we've got twenty two trucks that that go over the entire state of Texas. You know, we we're we're running. Um, I mean, the, the distribution al- alone is, is is a business of its own. So um, we found fa- we found a way to succeed with that, and we we, we love that, and it, it allows us to do some crazy stuff without worrying about margins quite as much as as if we were with a distributor. You mentioned competition that being able to walk, you used to be able to walk in and you know, hey, I'm a local brewery, and that's you know, here take our money, and we're going to buy your beer. Um, where is the competition coming from? these days is it other local breweries i know yingling just made a big splash coming into texas and i'm seeing a lot of posts on social media of people going nuts buying yingling lager um whether or not that'll you know last going into next quarter remains to be seen you know talk to the folks in massachusetts for a little bit of history but what's the where 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 do you feel the most heat competition wise Um, these days i i I would say it's it's you know, from other other Texas breweries that are, you know, near our size or bigger, I would say it's, you know, a lot a lot of uh, big regionals have come to Texas and not done well and pulled out of Texas very quickly. Um, they have not had a lot of luck with a big brand coming into Texas. You know, everyone gets excited for, for a little bit and then they're out. You know, I don't know if that's just the Texas pride thing or what, but... Mm. Um, there's a lot of examples of that. And, uh, you know, so it's not a lot of that. I think it's a lot of other locals. I think it's a lot of uh, just, you know, I feel like there's a lot of people in Texas that go to the grocery store and they buy a six pack of whatever the cool local brewery makes and they buy a 30 pack of Miller Lite. Um, and I, I just, that, <laughs> I, I feel like there's a large portion of the Texas consumer that, that shops that way. You know, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, that's what people want. That's what people want. Right. But um, and, 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 and to be quite honest, it's not a terrible way to buy beer. Um, but you know, I, I, I think that, you know, in Texas, we're still competing with a large portion of the population, um, a large volume of the beer that's drank being, you know, macro light lager. Um, so, you know, I, I wine and spirits, I, I see that being a big competitor. I see, you know, um, just, just, just other categories in general of alcohol being being a competitor, and uh, those are probably the biggest ones. I, 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 I you know, I, I, I don't feel a little bit of pressure from other locals. I mean, that you know, that's all. We're all we're all pulling from the same pot of buyers, so yeah. There's definitely some of that. Well, and that's 
what I over the years, I've always been curious about this. And you're all pulling from the same pot of buyers. It's a hundred percent accurate. Have you given thought how you can break out of that? How you can find people that aren't just on it, like only swimming in the craft pool? Yeah, I mean, and uh, you know, quite frankly, I, I you know, I, I, we've we've by by complete and total accident, we've done that with pickle beer. I mean, we found an entire new audience uh, that we never even imagined existed um, with that. Just, and then, you know, our, our sour beer program, which, you know, that's a story in its own, which, we, you know, we're, we're, I don't know, I'd say we're probably 60, 70% sour beer that all came about by accident. And now we're, our, our sour beers are almost the, I, I would almost put them in a, a separate category than, you know, a, a standard beer just because they're just, you know, they're, 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 they're so different than, you know, what, what people expect when you say beer. Um, I think a lot of those things have uh, opened us up to new people that, um, you know, probably wouldn't have expected a beer to taste that way. All right. Well, let me ask you this, uh, because I want to talk about pickle beer. When you first started, you said you started with four and only one still remains. What were the four and what's still standing? All right. So we launched with uh, Daybreak, which I call the, and these are all like my homebrew recipes, right? So like, these are the ones I decided would be like unique. And I, I decided I was going to stay away from sort of standard styles. So th these are the four I ended up with. Are, so these, the, are these the four that your friends told you were the very best? uh as a home brewer i think so yeah i mean okay. i don't know yeah probably sorry that was me being unnecessarily snarky no no it was it, it was definitely a every homebrew story is like oh i launched because like my buddy dave really liked my red ale and it's like wow has dave done any market research because red ales don't sell anymore yeah um yeah yeah i mean i've got i've got a whole rant about that and i and no, i mean and not 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 really i mean i i, I felt like i I, it was a combination of what people liked and what I liked and what I thought would sell. I mean, I thought it was a good lineup. So here we go. So it was, it was Daybreak, which 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 was sort of my light beer intro beer. I called it a four grain breakfast beer. It was made with barley, wheat, oats, and rye, milk, sugar, and honey. It was modeled after a bowl of cereal. You know, I got a whole story about how I was wondering why breakfast stouts are called breakfast stouts and why don't we make a beer that's actually there's a good reason to call it a breakfast beer and. So that was it. Was a light. It was light in color, light in alcohol, and an easier drinking beer. With it had a lot of complexity to it. And um, you know, as we launched it, brewers loved the beer because there was a lot of complexity in a light beer, um, and, it, and it, it did well on the market. But you know, just uh, and it never took. We we, we made a, a little, you know, funny little commercial for it, and we tried to push it and make it, you know, our big volume beer. It just it just didn't take. And then we had River House Saison, which was, uh, you know, dry Saison. That just was my personal favorite beer. And um, and then we had Pretzel Stout, which is a stout made with pretzels. Um, and that okay. one still comes back as a, as a seasonal. And that one did like pretty well. Like actual pretzels, just like taking pretzels, crushing them up and throwing them in there. Actual sourdough pretzels, yeah. I mean, okay. I, I like in the mash? Several hundred pounds of sourdough pretzels in the mash, in the mash yeah. And so we bring that back in the traditional variant, and we also have a peanut butter variant. We we bring back as seasonals, um, <laughs> and that was popular. But uh, stouts in Texas just don't. There, there's there's not any stouts in Texas that sell well. But um, you were so home brewing in Florida, where inexplicably stouts are beloved. Yeah, I mean, I I, I, like I, I look at I look at like Cigar City or you know like sure. what some of the other breweries are doing to Wakefield and. You know, they're putting out these big gooey imperial stouts when it's 99 degrees with humidity to match. And people are like, yeah, let's go drink a 10 percent stout. You know, I, I don't want to. Texas wanna, is not. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm from Texas. We were in Florida for a little while with my, my, my wife's job. And that's where I really started deciding I was going to start a brewery and got, you know, really got deep into home brewing. And, you know, and, and then, you know, I said, I want to move back to Texas to start the brewery. And, uh, you know, that, that, that that's the Florida part of it. Um, so, you know, I, I was brewing everything with, you know, Texas in mind and, and, you know, ultimately I, I, I won't comment too much on people from Florida, but, uh, people from Texas don't, 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 they don't play that game. Um, okay. you know, you, you can sell a stout in Texas in the winter for a little while and people get tired of it and then move on. I mean, there's a couple of year round stouts, you know, Lakewood here in, in Dallas has a year round stout called Tentris. That's sort of their flagship. 
um, which is really rare to have a stat as a flagship, but um, it's, it's, a, it's a tough sell. It really is. Um, almost nobody saw volume, volume of stouts here. So um, th that one was destined to fail for that reason, which I didn't, you know, as a, a naive home brewer that hadn't been, you know, in the, in the you know, selling beer market, didn't realize. And then, the, and then the, so the fourth beer, um, which is the, is the one that's still around as a double red, double IPA. Um, we, we've called it several different things, just a double red. We've called it a, just a double IPA. We've kind of like gone back and forth. Essentially, it's a it's a nine percent, uh, hundred plus IBU um, IPA called the Imperial Texan, and uh, that's the one that stuck around and it does pretty well. And uh, you know, we started with sixteen ounce four packs, and then we switched everything to twelve ounce, and that really switching from 16 to 12 ounces is what saved us from going out of business. When we did, when we did that switch, our sales just went through the roof. Is, um, is that, is, is that a mental thing? Is that because people think that they're getting more value if they buy a six pack as opposed to a four pack? It seems like it. I, 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 there's, that is, I, I, I think that they don't understand the, the 16 ounce four pack in general, a general consumer. I'm talking, you know, in I'm generalizing, but yeah, yeah. And, I mean, and, that, and now four packs are coming back. They're cool. That's all we sell in the tap room. Four packs of sixteen ounce that flies off the shelves in tap rooms. It's still on a shelf in a grocery store. You got to have a six pack. Yeah, I, but that I, thirty I think, pack that you were talking they, about from the grocery store, though. I mean, those are all twelve ounce cans that people are oh, walking yeah. out with. So th that's what if people are used to a certain format. Yeah. Yep. That's just you know, I, and to this day, you, it's it's very rare to to buy it. You know, if you're going to a big grocery chain to buy a I mean, the big guys have some 16 ounces, right? They can do that because, mm -hmm. but there's no, there's no craft 16 selling in big grocery or big liquor. Um, that to this day, they don't move, but in the tap room, for some reason, that's what people want. So, you know, we've, we've added it back in after we, you know, there was a big switch and it was a big, you know, at the time it was a big decision. We had to, you know, recycle a bunch of cans we couldn't use and it was a big deal. And then, you know, ultimately it was the, the saving grace, but. Um, and then, and then with the Imperial Texan, when we shift back, switched back to 12 ounce cans, um, we put everything in six packs except the Imperial Texan because it was a 9% beer. Yeah. And so we put that back in the market as a four pack and it, you know, it struggled as a four pack. And then while all the other ones got like booted out for other new beers, um, we ended up deciding to try out Imperial Texan as a six pack. And when we did that, man, that was the magic, that was the magic thing, man. Um, I feel like, yeah, for, for 9%, I mean, even me as a seasoned drinker at this point, like a pint of 9%, the older I get, that just sounds, I don't know. It sounds, uh, it's, I, it's, I, it's, it sounds brutal. I understand that a hundred percent as I get older as well. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, those, those, you know, kid wake ups at seven o'clock in the morning or six o'clock in the morning. You know. Yeah, I mean, your, your kids yeah. don't don't care how many pints of nine percent no. IPA you drank. It they're they still really, jumping on the bed at six a.m. They, they really don't, and I I just I find it really disrespectful. Mm -hmm. All right, so when I, I I I I sort of now see the theme here. You had a, a breakfast cereal beer, uh, you had a pretzel beer, um. The Cezanne, I mean, I, I would love to talk Cezanne, you know, all along, but people are now screaming into their car radios. Uh, talk about the pickle beer. Um, you've had a fondness for food in beer for a while. How did your pickle beer come into play, come into view? Sure. sure. So uh, I'll back up just a little bit, if you don't mind. Okay. No, uh, please. You know, when, when we launched those four beers and we had, you know, we we're out there doing sales, we realized quickly that, you know, what, what, what our accounts were asking was, what do you have that's new? Well, what do you have that's new? And I said, all right, well, let's do a seasonal program. And the very first seasonal we launched, we called September Fest, which, you know, we thought was a play on Oktoberfest. That's where we would be different. And uh, we had a little smoke malt to it. It was a little different than Oktoberfest. It was a really good beer, actually. Um, but, you know, that, that, that was our intro to, to, the seasonal beers and then um you know we figured out that they just kept asking well what's new what's new and if you don't have something new your your competition does have something new um and so we said all right well we'll make a new seasonal every month and from there it ended into you know every two per month and then um as of today we launch a new seasonal statewide in cans in package grocery store all over the place one per week and then another at least one in the tap room so we're launching two new beers 
uh, per week, one for entire whole statewide distribution. So it's, it's, it's quite the logistical challenge. And so, you know, I've, that, I've seen you've, you, you call these micro seasonals, micro seasonals was the term we made up for that. Yeah. And so uh, that, uh, you know, if one's successful, we'll bring it back the next year. If it's okay, we'll give it a rest for a year and bring it back. So, I mean, I'd say out of these 52 new beers we launch, um, about 60% of them are new every year. And so that, 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 that comes up with, you know, the, the joke, we, we were sitting around in the brewer's office and the brewer's office is saying, you know, four years ago, man, we're going to run out of ideas here pretty soon. Um, but that, they, that, that just hasn't happened yet. Um, and so we, we, we you know, you, as you know, as you've seen, it sounds like we, we've come up with stuff all over the place and there's really cool stories to some of those. More with Cody Martin in just a moment, but first a word of thanks to the companies that help keep Drink Beer, Think Beer on the air. Pairing rich notes of chocolate and coffee from roasted malts with deep tones of vanilla and oak from its time in bourbon barrels, each bottle of Dragon's Milk is a delicious adventure waiting to be opened. Find Dragon's Milk near you at dragonsmilk.com. And check out NZ Hops. At NZ Hops, they feel that sustainability is not only being a steward for the land, but for our future. We're in it together. Join the conversation at nzhops.co.nz or on LinkedIn, Instagram, or Twitter. And now back to all things pickled with Cody Martin of Martin House Brewing in Texas. The way pickle beer came about is the very first hire we had at Martin House. We have those three founders. We all worked here for free. Um, And there was this this kid. uh, He was on college break. His mom was a friend of ours, and she asked us to hire him for a summer, and so we did. To keep him off the streets, yeah, yeah. He was, I mean, he was—he's he, he was a good kid. He, he was Asa, and uh, he's a great guy to this day. I, I love him, and he knows that. I hope he, he probably won't listen, but anyway, Asa, I love you'd you. Be, for listening. You'd be surprised. There's a lot of there's a lot of people who listen to this show. Well, there you go. So, <laughs> uh, so anyway, I mean, he went from just you know uh, doing deliveries to you know cleaning the cellar to he ended up being like you know one of our top sales guys for a while he ended up leaving to go into the wine industry which i told him was a bad idea but i was really happy for him so he, he he's doing well anyway uh so he was friends with the marketing director at uh best made pickles who happens to be you know a, a very old and texas wide you know pretty big pickle maker here in texas and uh is, is it beyond texas because i i i I had to look it up before we started the show because I, I, I don't feel like I knew it. They have some limited distribution in some neighboring states, if I remember right, but they're almost, they're, they're definitely mostly Texas. Okay. Um, so it's a very old and well-known Texas brand and they happen to be three blocks from the brewery and he happened to be friends with the marketing person over there. And so, you know, we went over there with their team and we were going to do a, a, pickle with hops in it. And we had all these ideas and we did a bunch of small batches for some parties we had here. And, you know, we kind of went back and forth until finally we said, all right, look, it's a good time. Let's do a, just a, let's just do a pickle sour beer. Right. And so we thought it would be a seasonal. We thought we would make it and it would be done. And uh, to our, you know, surprise, it, you know, drove our growth, you know, 83% last year. It took every other brand with it. It got us a bunch of placements that we wouldn't have had otherwise. And I mean, it's just, it pulled the entire brewery up. It's probably 50 to 60% of our production now. Okay. Um, But here's the thing you say, okay, let's just make a pickle beer, right? That's not a a necessarily BJCP recognized style. I don't recall seeing it on stage at GABF. Um, I, what is the base beer? Is, is it so, a Goza? Right, right. So, so uh, up until the pickle beer, one of our, you know, one of the, you know, as we talked about the three that didn't make it, well, we replaced those with others. And one of the ones that did make it was a, a beer called the Salty Lady, which was a Goza, um, you know, semi-traditional sour base with coriander and salt sort of Goza. Okay. Um, and it, it was essentially, you know, the, the, the first iterations were just that beer with pickle brine added, right? Um, and then as we did, and, and so like, was it actually the best made pickle brine? Like it's you'd get, brine, you'd get germs of this from the yeah. picklery. Is that, is that from like, the, what, yeah. The what do they, factory. what do they call their, it, it? It's just a pickle factory. I guess. Yeah. I mean, I've never called it anything else, but I mean, we could make up a name for it right now. I think pickle porium. Sure. Yeah. They have yeah. a pickle, they have a pickle emporium, a gift shop. That's what they call it. Do they really? Yeah, Absolutely. What, what do you think is the coolest thing in the gift shop as you've walked through on your way out? 
So, uh, I mean, it's the coolest thing is because I have it is a, a pickle putter. So it's a, it's a, a golf putter where the, 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 you know, the part you hit the ball with is a, a pickle. Um, you know, it's, it's a stick with a pickle on the end and you play golf with it. A, a tradition like no other. Um, yeah, I know. Right. The, all right. So, so you were just getting drums of the pickle brine and then adding it in what, what in fermentation, like after yeah, no, I mean, so we basically blend it in, blend it into the bright tank. So we have to get it and we have to, we have to, we, we, we remove, you know, we, 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 we brew it a little stronger than the finished alcohol to, to, to make up for the dilution. And we have to remove the oxygen from, cause you know, cause they're not concerned with oxygen. So we no. deoxygenate it once we get it in. I mean, we, we have a, a, we have, I mean, I, I would, I would bet quite a bit that we're the only brewery in the world that has a tank, uh, you know, a 60 barrel tank dedicated to pickle brine. Uh, I, I was so, gonna. I was gonna say. So yeah. now, are you making the brine on site for the no, beer? They're still, the they're still sending it to us. That's probably the next step. I mean, and, you okay. know, it's, you know, brine's not that difficult, and I don't know. Right now, they. I mean, like they're, they're literally three miles down the road, so they. Okay. They send an but there, so there's with, authenticity though of it coming three miles away. Yeah. Yeah. They, they send the you know a, a best made branded eighteen wheeler over with a bunch of totes of pickle brine, and then we unload it into the bright tank, and we. We chill it and remove the oxygen and pre-carbonate it, and then we just blend that into the sour base that is the other half of the pickle, the other part of the pickle beer, not half. But here's my question about the brine. I have so many questions about brine. Yeah. Um, have the have has the brine that you're getting already held pickles? No, no, no. So they okay. they so, so it's that, that, it's, they, it's it's virgin brine. It's a, yeah. It's 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 their yeah. So that you know they have a. They they naturally ferment all their pickles and then they 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 jar it up with their brine. Which you you go on Amazon right now and buy a gallon of best made pickle brine. And, okay. And 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 we we use the we use a version without the food without the coloring, and without the preservatives. So they make a, a custom brine without the color or preservatives for us. So it's just you know the the vinegar and the salt and their spice blend. What um, what what color do they put into it? Like if, if I buy, I, so I've never had best made pickles. So now I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Um, what is yeah, the I mean, color it's a, it's of the brine? It's, it's a yellowish color. Um, okay. It's sort of the typical, I, I think most people would imagine that. Uh, yellow that pickle. vague mustardy kind of thing. Yeah. 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 So we, when we get it, it's clear. Right. Okay. All right. So it comes, you're blending it at the end. And is that how you originally did it or has, has it evolved over time? I mean, we've evolved the recipe over time. I mean, like I said, we originally just, you know, added it to our salty lady. That was the very first. I mean, those are, you know, those were the tiny little two keg versions that we made for special parties sort of stuff. Um, and as we, as we, you know, we, we tested it out, you know, we, we changed the, uh, we, we, we played with the, the level of alcohol. We've played with, you know, whether we're adding salt or not. And we stopped adding salt because the brine has plenty and, um, the coriander edition went away because it didn't add anything, that sort of stuff. And so it, it, it really is kind of a really uh, simple base beer, base sour beer um, with a minimal amount of hops. And it just really, it's really there to, to, to let the, the brine shine. I mean, they have, they, they really hang their hat on their unique flavor of their brine. Um, you know, every, every pickle guy has their, you know, that's their brine. That's their secret sauce kind of thing. And, you know, I, 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 we, we obviously like theirs and, and, you know, when you drink, when you drink it, it's, it's, it, it tastes like you're drinking pickle juice. I mean, there's, there, I, I don't know if you've had one, um, but it, it, it tastes like drinking pickle juice. And, you know, it's, I, I enjoy pickle juice. I used to drink, I drink it a lot when I'm working out or, you know, sweating a lot, you know, it's great for yeah. that sort of thing. And, you know, I've, I've always enjoyed it and, you know, people in Texas love it, man. It's, uh, it's been unbelievable and you know I, as it grew i kept thinking man this 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 has to be a fad just you know we do a lot of crazy weird fad beers and luckily we make it for a week at a time so once it's gone it's gone we don't need people to keep buying it over and over again yeah and so you know i was i, I was worried but you know it's just it's it, it, <clears throat> it, it literally hasn't stopped i mean it, it's it's unbelievable. yeah i mean on the surface it, it it might sound a little bit odd but when i was growing up like we always kept the the pickle jar after the pickles were gone in the fridge and you just take a couple of swigs out of it. Like it was not uncommon. And even a couple of years ago, I remember my local uh, in Jersey city uh, barcade was offering, you know, pickle 
shots, picklebacks um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, with, with their beer as well. Like that was a sort of a hipster thing for, for, for a little bit. Um, sure. So it's not uncommon and salt in beer uh, goes back a, 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 a long ways as well. Um, I just want to be clear when you guys are making your pickle beer, um, it's the dill brine, right? You're not doing, mm-hmm. you know, sweet or sour. Um, uh, and I also see that they do a bread and butter, which is my personal favorite pickle. Yeah. So, um, so, so yeah, I mean the, the beer that we, you know, the, the main beer is the dill brine. Yes. It's the sour dill or, you know, the, the regular dill brine, but I mean, they make several brines and to be clear, we've made a beer with every single one of them, at least in a small batch for, you know, we do a pickle party every single year where I think we had 40 variants of pickle beer. Um, which we should make 10 gallons at a time, you know, just by hand, uh, kind of homebrew system style, you know, taking yeah. the base beer and adding different brines. And um, we've launched at least seven or eight, uh, like big batches of different flavored brines. When, when do you uh, normally hold your pickle day celebration? Uh, we just had it. It's usually at the beginning of summer. Okay. So, uh, well, we're all off schedule now. So now I'm all confused. We had our anniversary party way after our anniversary, that sort of thing. Yeah. So, I, 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 yeah, it's 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 all out of whack. But it's usually the beginning of summer. All right. So we'll just mark our calendars for 2022. Um, so you've so you've done most of the varieties, if not all of oh, the yeah, varieties that, that best made. Yeah, pickle. I mean, they make a Bloody Mary pickle. We've done that. I mean, we, the jalapeno bread and butters. I mean, uh, we did a, a smoked pickle beer, you know, that wasn't one of their brines. That was one of our own creations, but we've done, you know, we've done peppermint pickle. I mean, there's really no limit. We just try it. We'll add anything to any beer just to see what happens. Well, I mean, there's ca- a- yeah. Case in point of doing anything. So I wake up, uh, yesterday morning, uh, Monday morning and my news feed on Facebook is filled, uh, with your brewery's post um about a grape kool-aid or you know grape uh sugar drink i don't know if we can actually use the word kool-aid um uh trademark wise uh and pickle beer uh but a a a bright purple dill pickle beer uh is now clogging up my timeline and people are either excited about it they're horrified by it they are uh, uh I, I don't know, ready to take to the streets for one way or the other about it. And you're probably just sitting in your office with your Ninja Turtle poster, um, all excited that you know, the world is on fire because of one of your beers. But um, wh- wh- what is that? What is it? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so, I mean, that's a, that, that, that's a, that's a South Texas thing or <laughs> maybe more than South Texas is to add, add Kool-Aid to your pickle juice when your pickles are empty, right? You had a, a packet of Kool Aid and a it's South and Texas, sugar. but you're in the Metroplex. I mean, we, we did. We, we, it, it, it makes its way up here. There's plenty of, okay. of, of people from South Texas here, and it's, okay. it's a well known. It's a well known thing. Uh, I would. Oh well, I don't know. Well known. It's a. It's a well enough known thing in Texas. Um, Kool Aid. How long have you? So known. you're from. Te- how long have you known about this? Like your whole life. Uh, I mean, I, I, probably yeah. I think so. What was I'm your first remember. memory of having Kool-Aid pickles? You know, it was probably in college. So it probably it was in college. Yeah. So it wasn't like localized to where I grew up Okay. Um, in East Texas. Uh, but once I, you know, moved to a bigger town in college, it was, uh, it was, it was drank there for sure. What was, was the, what was the, what was the context of your first Kool-Aid pickle experience? Somebody brings pickles to a party i mean the first experience was somebody had brought a jar of pickles to a party and it was red and they're like yeah it's kool-aid pickles and it was just a jar of pickles that someone excuse me someone had a kool-aid to it's really that simple all right so so you're saying it's that simple walk me through a recipe to make kool-aid pickles here at home Sure. Uh, Kool-Aid. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, add, add a cup of sugar to a big pickle jar and add a couple packets of Kool-Aid to your flavor. I mean, whatever flavor you like with it to your taste, that's, that's, that's Kool-Aid pickles. But are you that's doing, it. but are you doing already brined pickles? Like, am I taking cucumbers from the garden and just putting no, 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 them? No, no, no. I mean, I, I guess you could, but I mean, that's not, that's not the standard, right? I mean, I, there's definitely uh, some sort of, uh, you know, whole food style, uh, of making pickles that way, I would suppose. But I mean, this is, you buy your, you know, your 
best made pickles hopefully from the shelf and uh-huh. whatever your favorite brand of pickles are you literally open the jar and you add the kool-aid and that's kool-aid pickles you and add sugar. the you add the kool-aid to the already brined the jar of pickles straight off the shelf okay. from the grocery store yep and, and then how I long mean, do you let it how long do you let it sit for the, the longer you let it sit the more it like penetrates the pickle itself and then the pickle becomes red or blue or whatever color kool-aid you added um what do you uh, recommend I mean, my favorite has been the has been the fruit punch, just the regular fruit punch, red, red. Oh, no, I, right? Well, I mean, obviously, I mean, red's the best, the yeah. best flavor. Yeah. But um, I, I meant how how long do you think they that they should sit for? Yeah, I mean, you know, I my my personal experience with them probably isn't as good as others. I, I don't have a lot of data on that. I just I'm not I'm not even sure that I've made them myself. Um, it's always been you know what somebody brought over. Or somebody else shared. Um, I can't claim any expertise in that in that uh, in that way. And are these pickles in the jar? I just want to make sure that I'm getting this totally right here because I'm going to do this this week. Um, are these pickles uh, already sliced? Like, are they quartered in the jar? Or are they? Whole I've seen it. I've seen it both ways. Yeah, I've seen I've seen you know dill uh, hamburger slices, and I've seen okay. whole dills. I've seen spears. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of cool. You know, I, I, I would guess you leave it a week or so it would penetrate an entire pickle. I don't know. That's a okay. guess. I mean, I, I, I'm asking you, like, you're the guy who made a beer on this. So I feel like, yeah, you know. I mean, I've, I've got a lot of people around me and, you know, I, I have the advantage of not, um, worrying about it actually penetrating a cucumber because there are. You know, I'm just I'm just getting in the, the flavor in the beer. That's a lot easier than getting it in. If you're trying to get it into the pickle itself, I would guess that's a little um, that's probably a little more nuance, maybe okay. a different kind of nuance. I don't know. Definitely. So, I, I've, I've never flavored the cucumber itself, to be honest. I've only flavored the beer that tastes like a pickle. So. OK, so you have a 60 barrel fermenter, uh, 60 barrel bright with brine in it um, when you're making your Kool-Aid pickle beer. Um, was it just adding sugar colored powder to your bright? How, how, no, how I mean, we that? actually, yeah. I mean, for we, we actually, so we've done, we've done fruit punch and we've done blue raspberry and we've done grape now. And it's, it's uh, purple. It's not grape. It's just called purple. Right. Exactly. Now. So we actually used uh, grape, you know, uh, Concord grape concentrate uh, in the fermentation. And then we use some grape flavoring to top note it. And it got all the color it needed from the grapes themselves. Um, so you weren't just doing sugar powder, like you were actually using. Yeah, like we're, we're trying to imitate the Im- imitating the colors with a with, with a you know a, a more suitable ingredient for brewing. Just I mean, when we were trying to do blue raspberry, we were you know what. We, we, I mean, where do you get blue raspberry puree? Well, you, you don't. That's not a real thing. So yes. um, it does not appear in nature. Yeah, uh, we, we made a five barrel batch of it. And I think that we had our brewers open. Uh, and I, I couldn't even tell you how many packets of blue raspberry. It was a, you know, t- several five gallon buckets full by the time they were done. And they were all covered in blue. Um, it, it, it wasn't feasible for a large batch. So we had to kind of, uh, you know, figure out our own way um, there. Uh, and then with the grape, you know, we the, the the grape was a little more straightforward than blue raspberry, but uh, yeah, I mean, we 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 we've we've uh, we've become experts at getting weird flavors in beers, so um, there there there's nothing that's off limits. I, I was going to ask, is there anything that you wouldn't do? Because you've you know, done a- you've done a lot of crazy things. Are are there things that you wouldn't do? So uh, there's a, there's a joke around the brewery and, and, and it, and it is that like, you, you can't, you can't, you can't make a joke about a beer like, that. Be, like, yeah, what are we going to do next? So, but asparagus and onions. And like, if the wrong person overhears you, then there's going to be like an asparagus and onion beer, right? That's the joke. Not, I mean, this is, this is, this is, you know, for, this is dramatic. We're not really doing that, but I mean, we, we, we've made, we, we made uh, menthol and squid ink. Um, we've done, you know, ranch, ranch beer, ranch dressing beer, which tasted like a can of ranch dressing. I mean, we've done pizza beer, which quite frankly was, uh, exactly like a, a slice of pizza. I'm not, you know, it didn't, it, it sold well, but no one's going to buy it again, but it, it tasted like what we said it was going to taste like. So, um, you know, the, the, there's nothing I'll try. I and mean, we have a five barrel system that we play around with a lot. And so uh, on the five barrel system, 
I mean, there's literally nothing I want putting a beer. I mean, we're brewing, uh, I'm brewing uh, a, a Scotch ale next week. Um, that I'm gonna put haggis in. Um, so, you know, there really is, there really is no. I, there's nothing I wouldn't try. Absolutely not. I mean, you know, some of the, some of them aren't scalable to, you know, to make 240 barrels to distribute statewide, that sort of thing. But on a five yeah. barrel system, you know, and, 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 and we know that when we, when we brew on the five barrel system, we, we keep that in mind. If we, if it's something we're going to want to scale, we, we try to make sure we're using ingredients that are scalable, that sort of thing. Um, I, at, at what point though, because you did the chicken, uh, the, the, the Buffalo sauce beer, you did the ranch, um, if you're talking about pizza and, and all this, is there a point in your mind where the beverages you're making are no longer beer or do you try to re- ma- maintain beer essence throughout it all? Um, you know, I, I would say, uh, I, I'm not sure that. I mean, maybe from a historical standpoint, but as most people know, beer, I think just a sour beer in general is probably outside of the the flavor spectrum of beer to start with. And then, you know, I don't I don't know. I mean, who's to define what beer is? I mean, you know, as it's changed, the definition of beer has changed. So, I mean, I'm not I'm not the one that's going to decide that. And quite frankly, I mean, I'm not really I don't. You know, I want to make I want to make beers that uh, my customers find interesting. I want to make beers that taste like what I say they're going to taste like, and I want to you know I want to make beers that, that, that taste good, obviously. And so, you know, to be clear, we're making pizza beers and we're making you know squid ink beers and we're making ranch beers, but we're also making you know a, a, an awesome pilsner and yeah. an amazing year round IPAs. And so, you know, because you have that, to because that, like that 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 pays the bills, right? Right. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, no, it's. Pick, pick, pickle beer and our, our, our micro seasonal pays the bills and our micro seasonal is often extremely weird. So, huh. um, you know, the, the IPAs and the other, the other things are, they're good, but that's not what's paying the bills. The, the, the micro seasonal, you know, as a, as a collective is probably slightly bigger than pickle. Uh, I would say pickles probably, I, I don't know. It's hard to say maybe, maybe pickles 40 ish. And that's like, you know, it's hard to say. I don't know. I don't have the numbers in front That's of me. That's amazing. It's though. Growing and changing so much. That's a bit because in, in the past, right. I, I, I think of like dogfish head where, you know, all of the beers that Cal and Joni and his team were making uh, that were the, the batshit crazy ones. That's what got all of the attention, but it was 60 minute and 90 minute and in India Brown that was paying the bills in those early days. It, it, it's sort of interesting that, you know, all of the, you know, the crazy stuff that you're doing, um, is paying the bills so that you can have an IPA and a Pilsner and a Saison. And that's, yeah, I mean, and, and, and to be clear with what, what's unique about our crazy beers is, is that we make it and we make enough that will sell out in a week so that the store has an empty shelf that's ready for the next one in the next week. Yeah. So every time a customer goes back, they're not seeing the same beer for three months. Every time they walk in a store, they're seeing a brand new Martin house, crazy beer. And so we have a whole pie series of beer. We have a, a lemon icebox pie and a key lime pie and a marmalade and a, a blueberry muffin. They have like this similar artwork and a similar kind of style. It's a, we, 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 I mean, we call it our pie style, but it's a, a sour base with uh, a lot of real fruit. And then um, we've, we've, uh, and then a lot of lactose. So it's a, it's a sweet and sour fruit beer essentially. And it tastes like pie. It really does. And so we've really like wrapped it. So, you know, we're, we're running through those and then, you know, we do, we do hazy IPAs. We mix in with the, uh, the, the, the seasonals and, you know, we'll do some non sours and I mean the, the pizza beer is called space pizza. And then we've, you know, we invented the toucan uh, box for, uh, for barrel age beers, which a lot of people have started to copy. And, uh, we, what, what is that? So we, 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 uh, came up with the, we package our barrel age beers in two 12 ounce cans on top of each other in a vertical box that, you know, looks similar in size to a, a bomber box. Okay. Um, and then, so we, we have a full-time artist who's an amazing artist. So every beer, every beer we make has full custom art on it. Um, that, the, that, that people really get into. I mean, we, we, we saw a ton of like, you know, posters and people are collecting these cans and this art and especially the, the two can boxes. Um, you know, we kind of go crazy on that art. So, um, so to be clear, it's collectively like the fact that it's not just 
it's not a single or even four or five or maybe 10 beers. It's 52 crazy beers. It's the fact that every time you walk in, it's something different. Um, it's a, that that sells that, that particular, that micro seasonal brand. I don't, I don't want to keep you too much longer, but I'm curious. You said, you know, uh, sometimes beers will show up and then uh, maybe you won't do them again, you know, for another couple of years. How, how do you know when something is going to be a hit versus when customers are a little bit cool on it? I mean, it's a, I mean, it's shown in the sales numbers that's shown in the, the, the feedback on social media or the reviews on untapped and but like, the but, way we but, feel but, about but it. How, but how quickly does that happen? Like if, I mean, if you put out like the haggis beer on social media, is it within a couple of hours on social media where you're like, oh shit, we're going to have the haggis beer, a small batch tap room only to be clear. So like, yeah, just, you know, we make whatever well, we I, want, but yeah, for the, the, so, big, but yeah. The, the big, the big, the big batches are, 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 are I mean, it, it it, it's a, it's a matter of the week that so you know we make what we think we can sell in a week and so what happens is you know we have a, a spot in all of all these placements right we have a spot for our seasonal now if we put too much in that spot then it's not empty for the next seasonal and it causes problems so we spend a lot of time coming up with exactly how much we should make how much we should sell to each store so that whenever it's time for the next week there's an empty spot for that next beer right so um, it becomes obvious if there are no empty spots or if the empty spots happen in a matter of days, I mean, when it's a big hit, that's super obvious in a matter of days, right? Mm -hmm. When it's, when it's, when it's regular, when it's, you know, you know, a standard hit, it's, it's kind of like what we expect. Right. And then when it, when it's not, it's, you know, it's, uh, we're ready for to put another beer in there and the, the other ones aren't gone yet. It's that sort of thing. And we're like, all right, that, and that, you know, can create some backup. And, you know, so it's, it's a learning process with every beer and, uh, um, you know, it, it it's it, it, it's obvious in the matter of a week man is with social media and and just how it's selling through in the store that's what that's what tells the real story that's what the that's what the grocery stores care about um that's what you know our, you know our, our, uh, yeah, that's what keeps us on the shelves in the grocery stores if we're selling through or not there is there's got to be a little bit of trial and error in figuring out when you're using different ingredients um how to maximize flavor but also make it you know, not undrinkable, um, but actually like really enjoyable. Um, <clears throat> are there ingredients that you've been fooling around with for the last couple of years or at any period of time that you haven't been able to dial in yet? Is there, is there, is there a white whale of ingredients uh, that you want to put into a beer, but just haven't had the luck yet? I'm trying to think. I mean, there's really nothing we haven't. I mean, I, with the, with the five barrel system and then, you know, we've got some two barrel fermenters. I mean, there's really nothing we haven't gotten to explore. Um, as far as the flavor I really wanted to see in beer and wasn't able to get in beer. I mean, nothing's popping in the, in the mind right away. Hmm. I mean, I, I, I feel like, uh, you know, uh, if you want to get a flavor in a beer, there's, there's definitely ways to do it. Um, I, you know, I, I, I can't think of a flavor that I wanted in a beer and wasn't able to get in it, to be quite honest. Okay. I mean, some, some of the fruits are, you know, the, 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 you know, some fruits stand out more than others, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. but then you can use, you know, essences and then you know, there's a ton of different formats of fruit and the freeze dried powders are really good for fruits that, that won't stand out in a concentrate. So we found, you know, we found a lot of, a, a lot of, uh, we, we've just, I mean, we've done just uh, so many beers and we've done this so many times that, I mean, that. It, it, it's you finally figure out that there's really no flavor that there's no ingredient that you can't get. There's no flavor that you can't get into a beer. I mean, uh, and, I, and again, I, this isn't all me. I have an awesome team of people that, you know, that help me in brewers and, uh, and such that, that, you know, I sit, sit in an office and, you know, taste different variants of, flavors and fruits and formats and stuff like that so yeah um, we do a lot of that stuff we were able to brew it on our you know five barrel system we'll, we'll brew a base beer and then do different fruit additions in the smaller fermenters until we you know figure out what we want 
so to bring this back to pickle beer before I let you go, uh, so you've done blue raspberry, you've done uh, fruit punch. Now it's purple. What is, I don't know. What's next. What would you like uh, to see next? Yes. I mean, the, the, the fruit punch one was actually a, a, a rum barrel aged fruit punch pickle beer, which came out, came out really good. Um, we, uh, yeah. We've done a uh, barrel aged Imperial pickle beer. Um, hot uh spicy pickle which mm-hmm. we just used their spicy brine is, is a very very popular one yeah you bloody mentioned mary. a rauk uh, pickle as well yeah uh bloody mary pickle so i mean we, yeah. we've we've uh done the gamut on those i i you know um oh man we, we, we've just we, we've done so many little variants of these pickle parties we've done mustard pickles and smoked pickles and mint pickles and um I, I, I honestly, I, I, I don't know what the next one's going to be. I mean, I, I, with the brew, me and the marketing guys and all the brewers, we sit down every Tuesday and we kind of like, you know, uh, kick around ideas to, to see what's coming up next. You know, with this weekly launch, it's we're, we're, we're planning things, you know, up to, to, to six, eight months in advance. So, uh, it, it, uh, I, I, I honestly don't, I, I don't know. I mean, we, I don't think we're at the end of it yet. We always, we always think we're going to run out of ideas, but we haven't yet. So, um, I don't, I don't have one yet. All right. Yeah. Well, if, uh, if, if all of the listeners here have ideas, uh, I'll point them towards your, uh, your social media pages and they can, they can start to share their ideas. How's that? Oh yeah. Send them out. That sounds good. Awesome. Cody, thanks for being on the show this week. And, uh, thanks for giving some context to, uh, what is clearly dominating, all of beer social media uh, these last couple of days. Uh, I, I, I appreciate you coming on the show, especially with uh, short notice. Absolutely. Uh, happy to be here. I had a good time. Okay. Are you making coolicles at home? I'm going to give it a try this weekend. And if you go for it, share the results on social media at the beer edge. And as always, you can reach me on email at John Hall. That's J O H N H O L L at beer edge.com or on Twitter at John underscore hall. And if you love smoked beers, and of course you do, a reminder to check out the This Week in Rauk Beer group on Facebook or on Twitter and Instagram at TW Rauk Beer. And if you're interested in advertising, please reach out to Liz Melby at Liz at BeerEdge.com and she'll let you know all of the important information. And speaking of that, this episode was made possible by the support of NZ Hops. It's the cooperative of master hop growers. They are a passionate collective of farms dedicated to innovation and sustainability. Leading the charge in sustainable farm practices, some NZ Hop farms have over five generations of knowledge that inform their composting program used by growers to promote healthy, regenerative growth of hops year upon year. This creates high quality soil, a critical component of healthy growing conditions. At NZ Hops, they feel that sustainability is not only being a steward for the land, but for our future. We're in it together. Join the conversation at nzhops.co.nz or on LinkedIn, Instagram, or Twitter. And we're also brought to you by Dragon's Milk. 20 years ago, New Holland Brewing Company embarked on a journey into the unknown, brewing the first batch of Dragon's Milk bourbon barrel aged stout. What started as a single barrel in the back of the brewery has transformed into the best-selling American-made stout today, pairing rich notes of chocolate and coffee from roasted malts with deep tones of vanilla and oak from its time in bourbon barrels. Each bottle of Dragon's Milk is a delicious adventure waiting to be opened. Find Dragon's Milk near you at dragonsmilk.com. A reminder, before we go, check out the Beer Edge podcast wherever you download podcasts. And as always, Nate Schweber does the music, Jeff Quinn designed our logo, and I'm John Hall. New episodes release every Wednesday, and that's when I'm going to be back again to drink beer and to think beer.